to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 i'll be there all right good singing you may be seated i know how shannon's gonna uh answer the role i'm in my place is probably what she'll say my dad will say yep and uh, anyhow, it's a Sunday school teacher meeting joke there. Everybody tries to get clever. As Brother Dix has taken role in Sunday school meeting, everybody tries to get clever, come up with something new that other people don't say. Uh, and they, they'll say, present in my place, here I am. Don't you know it? Any, anyhow, strange, strange group of people we've got. But I love them anyways. All right, only two prayer requests to bring to your attention tonight. The first one is Denny Furtaw. Denny is Terry's brother, lives in the Columbus, Ohio area, and we've prayed for him for years now. He's had cancer, and he's gone into remission. Then he gets it somewhere else, and it goes into remission. He's heard me give the gospel numbers of times as he's been in church or at Cass's funeral. Uh, he's been witnessed to by other people, and he just has never accepted Christ. He hasn't, nor has his wife. And uh, Terry's concerned <clears throat> that the Lord may not give him much more time here. And so let's pray together, would you, that Denny would trust Christ. Christ, that his wife would trust Christ. I sent her a list of soul winning churches in the Columbus area. She's going to try to get in touch with them and have uh, someone, a soul winner from those churches, go and see him and try to witness to him. So pray for Denny and his wife as well. Then the other prayer request is for Bob Serjala. Uh, many of you remember Bob and Janet, and uh, they're in Florida for the winter time again. And Bob's health has taken a bit of a turn for the worse. He ended up in the hospital a few days ago. And then today, uh, they, they discovered that he's got something that may affect his heart uh, in a fatal way. So please pray for Bob, pray for his health, and pray for Janet while she's down there tending to him, please. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, and we're thankful to be in your house. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. I'm so grateful and happy to see them roll in and park their cars and be in the house of God every service here. And in spite of the busy holiday tomorrow, uh, folks are in their place ready to go, and we're grateful for that. We do pray your blessing upon our service tonight. I ask that the Holy Spirit would be able to speak to our hearts and do the work that needs done. We think of these two requests tonight, both of them very important to us and to those we love. We pray for Denny and his wife and their need for salvation. We know Terry's burden for them, and we know that Denny has clearly heard the gospel. He's been given opportunities to be saved and yet has said no to Christ. We don't want him to pass in that same state. Father, would you please convict his heart Use your spirit to bring him to the truth. We pray the same for his dear wife, that she would also hear the gospel clearly. We pray that uh, Terry would be able to get in touch with a church that would be able to send a soul winner by his way and that he would uh, be home and receptive to what they have to say. Lord, please let this couple trust Christ. We pray next for our dear friends Bob and Janet. Bob in the hospital with some pretty serious uh, complications. 
uh, to the treatment that they've been giving him. Uh, and now this possible heart fatality. Lord, would you please be with his body, touch him. We'd like to see you give him more time. We sure do love that guy. He's a great spirit. He's a great witness for you. And he has a heart for you like none other. And we just pray for Janet as well as she's there with him, very concerned and fearful uh, and prayerful about his condition. Give her peace, give her comfort and grace and strength. Those two need each other. And we pray that you'd bring him through this and bring it, uh, him through it soon. We pray again your blessing on our service. May we learn and grow from what we discussed tonight. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's take a quiz. Jeremiah. And Lamentations. Isaiah, you can come get one of these if you don't mind. Serenity, are you interested in helping tonight? Very good. If you give one of those to her, please. <clears throat> Jeremiah and Lamentations. We're not starting until chapter number 35 tonight, so I'm jipping you by nine chapters. Not a very lengthy quiz tonight, so you'll want to be on your toes if you want to candy out or if you want to get any candy at all, possibly. <clears throat> the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 35, is where we're starting this evening. Jeremiah 35, going to the end of the book, and Lamentations as well. All right, are we ready? Away we go. What did the Rechabites refuse to do? Mother. Drink wine is correct. Chapter 36. Who wrote the words of Jeremiah down for him? Who wrote? Marianne. No, that's not it. I'm sorry. Good guess. Who wrote the words of Jeremiah? Brooke. I would say Baruch, but I'll accept Baruch. We're talking about the same guy. Is it Baruch, Rick, or Baruch? Oh, you don't know? Sounds Middle Eastern to me. What would you say, Shireen? Baruch. Okay. All right. Still chapter 36. What did the king do with the scroll that was read to him? What did the king do? Jeanette? If you can give me the next step, I can accept that. I'll tell you what, I'll give you credit for that. Eva, can you finish it? He threw it in the fire, yeah. So he took a pen knife, he cut out the parts that he didn't like, and he threw it in the fire. Not unlike a lot of Christians today when they come across parts of the Bible they don't like, by the way. I'm not looking at you for any reason, Rick. <laughs> All right, there's a sermon in there somewhere, isn't there? How much information did the second role that Jeremiah dictated contain? How much did the second role that Jeremiah dictated contain? How much information? Still in chapter 36. Mother. Maybe. Brent? Mm. Ellen? No, I was reading where 20 years Okay. Shannon? That's what I saw this one. Marianne? They got in the world of No. Let me read the question one more time. How much information? Did the second role that Jeremiah dictated contain? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Anyone? I have my answer, and it doesn't match any of your answers, so I'm just curious if uh, any of you are right or all of you are wrong. What if I said this, more than the first? No. Yeah, no one said that, right? No. Yeah, okay. So where's 
Uh, what chapter is this? 36. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words uh, of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. That's what Sharon Stiff said, isn't it? Okay, that's what I was looking for. Does anyone else feel like that was your answer? Brent, does that feel like that was your answer? No? Ellen? That was my mother's answer, so yes. Isaiah, wake up, friend. Sharon Stiff. You said the same thing? Okay, Shannon Stiff. Yeah, that's, that's the bandwagon we're going to jump on here. <laughs> if we did what? Yes, that's true. All right, chapter 37. Where was Jeremiah put by the princes, Rick? In prison, that is correct. Who brought him out of jail to hear the word of the Lord? Brent? That is correct. Chapter 38. What wasn't present in the dungeon where Jeremiah was placed? What was not present? Donna Wildman. No water. Correct. No water in the dungeon. Serenity. Donna Wildman, please. <laughs> Chapter 39. What did they do to Zedekiah once they captured him? Brent? They did. They put his eyes out. What were Nebuchadnezzar's instructions to Nebuchadnezzar concerning Jeremiah? Russ. That's correct. Yes, sir. Look well, do no harm. Very good, Russ. Chapter 48. How about all them names? Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. These are some good names, aren't they? Chapter 48. Why would Moab be destroyed? Mother. Uh, I'm going to turn that down for now. Shannon. Brent. That's correct. They magnified themselves against the Lord. Sharon Stiff, Shannon Stiff, do either of you believe that was your answer? No? Okay. Just checking. Brooke? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, next, uh, chapter 50. Who caused the people to go astray? Chapter 50. Jeanette? Uh, you're a good guesser. I just don't know. Let me see if, let me just, let me see if the very next person gives me the word I'm looking for. If they don't, then I'll give it to you. Who caused the people to go astray? Anyone? Ash. They're shepherds, Jeanette. Ash did beat you out. But you're a good guesser, that's for sure. Yes, right. Good guess, Evelyn. Chapter 51. What was Sariah to do with the book that Jeremiah wrote? What was Sariah to do with the book that Jeremiah wrote? It's a challenging book, isn't it? What was Sariah to do with the book that Jeremiah wrote? Judith? Nope, not read it. Sharon Stiff. That's right. Tie a stone to it and throw it in the Euphrates River. How about that? 
Lamentations. Lamentations. Are you ready? Lamentations. Rick? Jeremiah. Jeremiah that is correct. Uh, let, let's go ahead and ask this. We've never asked this before. What is a lamentation? Rick? Okay, I'll accept. It's a mourning or a weeping, a lamenting, right? It's a, a mournful state. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. How many letters are in the Hebrew alphabet? Rick? No, that's the English alphabet. It is actually in chapter 1, Ellen. Well, why don't you take a good look at them and see if you can figure it out? Everybody wants something for nothing, Ellen. Rick? 22, that is correct. Ellen, how many verses are in chapter 1? How many verses are in chapter 2? How many verses are in chapter 3? No. 66. How many are in chapter 4? How many in chapter 5? How many in chapter 6? All right, just making sure you're paying attention. No, you don't. I'm just trying. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. You can earn a candy if you can tell me why. What's the, the, what's the symbolism there of these 22 and 66 verses? What do you think is happening? No? This is your shot. I'll give you, I'll give you the whole bucket of Isaiah's candy if you can tell me. You got to give me the answer. Oh, Russell, what do you think? Yeah, that's not what I'm looking for, though. Good, good guess. Anybody know? I'm surprised you don't know this by now. We talk about it all the time, Jeanette. No, it doesn't. No. Okay, so. Think about it, folks. I'm doing everything I can to lead you to water. In that chapter. Yeah. So, okay, how many letters in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. So if a chapter has 22 verses, what do you think is happening? Every verse starting with a letter of the alphabet. Well, no, no. You're being confused by the 66. Four of the five chapters have 22 verses in them. So it's like a poem. Every verse starts with the next letter of the alphabet. The chapter that has 66 verses, they do that three times. It goes through the Hebrew alphabet all three times. That makes sense? You should never forget that now, ever, in your entire life. You should never, ever forget that. Oh, let's see here. Chapter number three. Chapter three. Because of the Lord's what... Rick? That's correct. Because of the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Chapter 3. What, what attribute of the Lord's never fails? You're candied out now, aren't you, Rick? Mother, are you candied out? Ellen, what do you have to say? Mercy. No. <laughs> Good guess. <clears throat> what of the Lord's never fail? Russ, his compassions, his compassions. What song, what hymn do we sing that mentions that verse? You're candied out, right, Rick? Yes, Shannon? Yes, great is thy faithfulness. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. Right? Good. All right. All right. Last question. What should a man bear in his youth? What should a man bear in his youth? Anyone? Anyone at all? There's, uh, I don't know. I think it's chapter three. It may not be, though. It may not. I don't know. I don't have a chapter written beside it, which usually means that it's under the same chapter I just read. 
what is good for a man to bear in his youth? Ellen? That's correct. Good job, Ellen. You came in there right at the buzzer. All right. Serenity and Isaiah, you may each take your candies. You can take some for yourself. All right. All right. Thank you, lady and gentlemen, very much. Brother Rick, Brother Brent, would you guys like to help? There are gnats in here. Are there gnats down where you are? Yes. Yeah? Gnats. I shouldn't tell you what's going on. How many of you want to know what's going on? Nobody does. Good. Winston does. All right. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, please. 2 Timothy 3. We started two weeks ago a mini-series called Enemies of Soul Winning. There are some positions that churches, denominations, and Christians take that are unbiblical and actually contrary to the goal of evangelism. Thank you, sir. The first one we talked about was what? Anybody remember? Winston. No. That was we did cover Calvinism. But two weeks ago we yes. Lordship salvation. The idea that until you make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you're not even saved. That allows for no room for growth, uh, and it is an enemy to soul winning. What's the second one we talked about last week, Russ? Uh, say it again. Yes, correct. Thank you. Hyper dispensationalism. Uh, taking salvation and making it different depending on what period of time you're in. Tonight, number three, formal worship is an enemy of soul winning. Formal worship. We are pretty informal around here. We're organized but informal. We seek to be professional, but we're informal. For instance, uh, we, we don't have any robes on our choir, right? Uh, we don't have any stained glass windows. We don't have any Gloria Patre. We don't uh, read from any Levitical books. Uh, we don't do anything like that. We're, I don't wear a robe when I preach. Uh, we're informal. Our singing is, is not... Uh, is not toned down, it's, it's energetic and evangelistic in nature. And we're going to point out tonight how this idea that services held by a local church are supposed to be formal for the purpose of worship. Uh, it's incorrect, it's bad theology, and it's also an enemy of soul winning. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into it tonight. Father, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us, help us to clearly look to scripture for our leading and leading and not to our own ideas or traditions or upbringing. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, you have to be careful that you don't start building sacred cows in your life. We talked about this when we started the series I don't care what any church teaches. If it contradicts the Bible, the Bible's right and the church is wrong. I don't care what any TV preacher or, TV or preacher author at the Christian bookstore, I don't care, radio preacher, I don't care what any of them say. If it contradicts the Bible, the Bible's right and they're wrong. I don't care what your own personal logic leads you to. If your logic leads you to a position that's different than what the Bible teaches, the Bible is right and you are wrong and I am wrong. I don't care what experience you may have, a personal experience. I, I had an experience with Jesus. Well, if that experience contradicts what the Bible teaches, the Bible is right and our experience is wrong. You have to have a final authority in your life. If you have no final authority, you have no standing for truth. That's what's the, the trouble with our nation right now. Uh, there is no, no definitive truth. You know, when you start saying that there are more than two genders, you're, you've just lost reality. 
There, there has to be a standard of truth. And, and the irony is for the, the crowd that was preaching science, science, science for all those years, uh, when it comes to the gender dysphoria that people claim to have, they don't want to rely, rely on science for that. You know, the same group of people that can't define a woman then wants to determine what is allowable that a woman can or cannot do with her body. Well, you can't even tell me what a woman is, so how can you tell me that? <clears throat> so there has to be truth somewhere. The Bible says, thy word is truth. If you want to know the truth, you go to the Bible. You say, I disagree with the Bible. Well, you're probably wrong about other stuff too then, right? So... I'm not trying to be antagonistic, but I'm doing a really good job at even not trying. So we're going to talk about two things tonight. Thing number one is what the Bible says about worship. We hear a lot about worship services, and we hear a lot about worship centers. Uh, just so you know, we don't have any worship centers here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, nor do we have any worship services. I'll explain why as we go through. Number two is what is the purpose of the church? Wouldn't you say these are two pretty important things to know what the Bible says about worship and what the true purpose of the church is? Very important to understand this. Now, let's define formal worship. Formal worship is the stiff, no pun intended, rigid service where the Spirit of God cannot work and move. Formal worship is the stiff, rigid service where the Spirit of God cannot work and move. One uh, preacher that I know of very well uh, was preaching on the campus of Bob Jones University, and this was years and years ago, and he had brought a few guys with him uh, to hear him preach, and he's preaching along, and the guys that he brought with him were saying amen. And when they said amen, ushers would walk down the aisle, tap them on the shoulder and say, gentlemen, please remain quiet here. We don't allow amens. And they quieted them down. Well, why not? They wanted their service to be formal. They didn't want anyone saying anything uh, out of the ordinary or, or, or responding at a time when they didn't give them clear direction as to how to respond. Uh, for the record, you're welcome to say amen here. Uh, try to say it at appropriate times. If I say the Bible's the word of God, say amen. If I say, I'm not a very good preacher, don't say amen then. You, you say, oh, pastor, write me a note after the service. You shouldn't put yourself down like that. Anyways, uh, but, but say amen when the Lord uh, is working in your heart. An invitation is a time when the Holy Spirit moves and, and we come forward and we kneel and pray and do business with the Lord. So let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 5. 2 Timothy 3, 5. We're going to use our Bibles a lot tonight. My goal is to get you out of here by 8 p.m. If you cooperate with me, you'll be gone by 8. Uh, if not, it'll be 8.05 probably. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So if I were to ask you what the source of power is for a Christian or for a church, what would you tell me? The Spirit of God, right? Right? We prayed for the month of October there, six weeks even, September and October. Lord, fill us with the power of your spirit. Acts chapter 2, the, the spirit of God came down like a fire out of heaven. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So the, the power of God comes from the spirit of God. So here in 2 Timothy 3, 5, we're told that, that there are Christians or churches that have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. There's no true spirit working in that church or amongst those people. And formal worship does that very thing. It removes all of the spirit of God and all of the power of God. Uh, I'll pick on them just a little bit, but I've attended a, a Roman Catholic mass once just to see what it was all about. And I'll tell you what it was about it was about nothing. It was dull. 
and boring. I remember kneeling on kneelers. You did that, Rick? Little kneeler. You, have you seen Roman Catholic pews? The pew in front of you has a kneeler on it, and you, you get down on your knees, and you get back up in your seat, and then you stand up, and you're back on your knees, and, and back and forth. Uh, they, gave, they gave communion, what they called uh, communion there uh, at the end of the service. But it was, it was terribly boring. The, the service was in Latin. How many of you speak fluent Latin? Do you think you would have been edified and helped by the message then? Careful, Shireen, we're going to confuse you with a Latin speaker. You raised your hand at just the wrong time there. <laughs> so what happens? It's a form of godliness. It denies the power thereof. No one got saved. No one rededicated their life to Christ. No one confessed any sin. They just came and went through their ritual. By the way, you can do that too, even at a spirit-filled church, even here. You can come and just go through the motions, but that's more on your willingness to seek God's participation in your life than it is the fault of the church, you understand. So, let's get into this. The first instance of worship in the Bible is in the book of Genesis, chapter number 22 and verse number 5. Will you turn there with me? Genesis 22 and verse number 5. This is where the time is going to uh, really see if we'll, we'll make our goal or not. It'll be turning to these passages. They are in order as you go through your Bible. Genesis 22 verse 5 says this, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So this is the story where Abraham is going to take Isaac to the mountain and sacrifice him in obedience to the command of God. Do you remember when God gave Abraham this test? Now God is not for human sacrifice, but God was testing Abraham here. By the way, spoiler alert, if you don't know the story, he did not have Abraham sacrifice Isaac uh, in the end. He stopped him from doing so. He wanted to see if he'd do it or not. But it's very interesting that here come Abraham and Isaac, and they're going to build an altar. Abraham is going to tie his son to that altar. Abraham is going to take a knife, and he's going to kill his son. What did he tell the servants he was going to do? I and the lad are going to worship. Does that sound like any worship you've ever been a part of? I mean, we haven't, you know, killed a kid around here in a long, long time. Uh, that we don't think building an altar and sacrificing a child is worship. Now, the understanding of this is sacrificing to God is worship. When you put your offering in the Thanksgiving offering Sunday, you worshiped. You gave to God uh, of sacrifice there. The next uh, text, go to chapter 24, please. Genesis 24. We're going to read three verses throughout this chapter. 24, 26, 24, 48, and 24, 52. So 24, 26. This is a story of Abraham's servant seeking a bride for Isaac. Verse 24, and she said unto him, nope, I'm the wrong verse, verse 26, and the man, this is speaking of the servant, bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. Look at verse 48, please. And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord. And bless the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. That verse is simply recounting what happened in verse 26. Now verse 52. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. This is something that I want you to take note of as we go through all of these verses about what true worship is. Each step of the way, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, worships God. He's not in a building. He's not in a church. Uh, he's not with another group of, of believers in God. He's all by himself, and he's bowing his head and bowing himself to the ground. Letter E. I don't know if yours is E or not. 
Nope, letter D for you. Worship in the Bible was always an individual act. Worship in the Bible was always an individual act. If you do a word study on the word worship or worshipped, you'll never find a time when it's a group. Not once. Do you see how we call things by certain names that are completely unbiblical? For us to call this a worship service would be unbiblical. Now for you to go home tonight and for you to get on your knees at your bedside and pray and praise God, that's worship. What you're doing here right now, you're not worshiping. And that's okay. What we see, in fact, we, we've already said this, we don't have a worship service in our church. Sunday school is a Bible teaching time. The morning service is a preaching service. The evening service is a preaching service. And the Wednesday night time is a Bible study time. We don't have a single worship service all week long. What are we doing wrong? You know what we're doing wrong? Nothing. We're doing in our services exactly what they did in biblical services. There was preaching and Bible teaching and corporate prayer. But there's never worship mentioned in any of them. Let's go to Exodus chapter number 34, please. Worship was always, boy, what is that letter? F. I know you'd, you'd like to know, wouldn't you? Worship in the Bible is always an individual act. Uh, there's not one mention of a worship service in the Bible. You got that one? Uh, uh, worship was always private. Worship was always private. Exodus 34. Exodus chapter 34. Who do you think we're going to talk about here? Moses, you are right. Exodus 34, verse number 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Again, notice, it's always a physical posture in worship. The head is always bowed or the body is prone to the ground or even prostrate. Those two words are always fun when you mix them up. Prostrate. Judges, chapter number 7. Who do you think we're going to talk about in Judges? Any guesses? Correct, Gideon. Very good. Joshua, Judges. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Chapter number 7. Judges chapter 7, verse number 15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Gideon, all by himself, bows to the earth and worships. First Samuel chapter 1, who's worshipping here? Not Samuel. Who? Yeah. Not Saul. Hannah. Good job, Ellen. You're redeeming yourself slowly, one question at a time. You try. I know you do. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And that they is just husband and wife, Elkanah and Hannah, worshiping together because of the promise that was given to them by Samuel. Verse 28 of 1 Samuel. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. These are the words of Hannah. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord and he worshipped the Lord there, speaking of Samuel. 1 Samuel 15, verse number 31. 1 Samuel 15, verse number 31. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. 
2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel 12. Verse number 20. 2 Samuel 12, 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Now notice, he's worshiping in the house of the Lord, but nobody we've talked about yet has worshiped in the house of the Lord. I guess maybe Elkanah and Hannah possibly did. So we're not saying that you can't worship in God's house. We're saying that the only place to worship is not God's house. And God's house is not primarily designated as the place of worship. 2 Samuel 12, 20, that's what we just read. Next, Job chapter number 1. Job chapter number 1. Verse number 20. Job 1, 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. Well, that's a strange way to go about worshipping. Why don't we all do that tonight? Let's all shave our heads, rip our clothes up. Russ is not fair. He's already got half of his head done. You're a good sport, Russ. I love you. I'm just teasing with you. Job falls on the ground. He's not in church. He's not in a worship center. He's not at the temple. He's not at the house of God. He's just out in his yard, presumably. And he falls down on the ground and he worships. Matthew chapter number 8. Go all the way to your New Testament now. First book of your New Testament. Matthew chapter number 8. Verse number 2. Are you getting these blanks okay? Good. Just making sure. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 2. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. This leper comes alone to Jesus and worships him. Do you understand that worship is not so much where you are, but who you're directing your worship to? Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 18. Matthew nine eighteen. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. So this ruler worships Jesus Christ on the road. Matthew chapter number 15. Verse number 25, Matthew 15, verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. This is a Gentile woman whose daughter is sick, and she's seeking Jesus' help in order for her to be healed. And so you've got a Gentile worshipping. She's not in the temple. She's on the street and she falls down and worships Christ. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, John chapter number 9. John 9. Verse number 38. John 9, 38. This is a blind man who's come seeking healing. And he said, Lord, I believe And he worshipped him. Of course, meaning the blind man worshipped Jesus. Acts chapter number 16. Acts 16. Verse number 14. Acts 16, 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Lydia worshipped God. Acts chapter number 18, 
Verse number seven. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. So Justice worshiped. Now Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews 11, verse number 21. Hebrews eleven twenty one, By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Let's look at worship in the New Testament. I know we've already been here some. In the New Testament, worship is mentioned 35 times. Let's start at Matthew chapter 2. Never in the New Testament either does it deal with a public worship service. Now what we did with that first section of verses from Genesis through Hebrews was show you that that worship is an individual act and not a group act or a corporate act. I got news for you. And it's not going to make a lot of people happy, and it's probably going to make an equal number mad. All this, that's not worship. It's just not. They might be praying. They're not worshiping God. First off, you don't look up when you worship God. You look down. And more times than not, you're on the ground. You're either kneeling or you're, 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 you could be kneeling, you could be, we'll call it a Muslim prayer position where their body is laid out in front of them, yet they're on their knees. Or you could be prostrate, meaning completely on your belly, on your face before God. When you find Jacob in Hebrews 11 on his staff, he's an old man that can't get down in those positions anymore. But his head is still down. When you find, uh, 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 I forgot his name already, the servant of Abraham, uh, Eliezer, he's bowing his, his head to the ground. That's the, the least position of worship, is the bowed head. 99% of the time, you're on your knees or you're on your face before God. That's worship. The whole hands up, swaying around. And I'm not opposed to hands up. The Bible says lift up holy hands. But that's not worship. We have to define our practice by what the Bible tells us. So all of those verses we just gave you, everyone we just mentioned, Moses, Gideon, Hannah, Saul, David, Job, the leper, the ruler, the woman, the blind man, Lydia, Justice, and Jacob, individuals the only one that possibly not individual is 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 hannah and elkanah but the bible if you want to argue with me i'll go the the two become one flesh husband and wife worshiping together are one worshiping together if you want to nitpick it let's go new testament now what does the new testament say what does the what does it say regarding the church and so forth it's mentioned 35 times in the new testament and never does it deal with a public worship service. Matthew 2.2, 2, who do you think we're talking about here? Wise men. It's almost Christmas season. Matthew 2.2, 2, saying, these are the wise men speaking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. The wise men came for the very purpose of worshiping Jesus. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 8. Matthew 2, 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem, this is Herod, and said, go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You could put that word worship in quotation marks though, couldn't you? Herod had no intention of worshiping Jesus. He was going to kill Jesus. But Herod, as a leader of the Jewish people and a Jew himself, do you think he knew what worship entailed? Sure he did. Matthew chapter number 4 and verse number 9. 
This is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness by Satan. And Satan speaking here, saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan wanted Jesus all by himself to get on his knees before the devil and worship him. Individual, not corporate, not part of a service, on your face before someone, worshiping. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, verse number 9 here. We kind of dealt with this at the beginning of the lesson. In vain do they worship me, teaching for commandments the doctrines of men. This means we don't come up with our own doctrine and then teach it as the truth of the word of God. If we did that, that would be vain worship. So all the smoke machines and colored lights, it's vain worship. All the lifting up of hands, the odd thing is those hands were lifting up Budweiser cans in the bar the night before to honky-tonk woman probably. Now they're in church on Sunday morning. It's hypocrisy. Pat Boone used to sing in the bars on Saturday nights, then he'd get up and sing in church on Sunday morning. Elvis Presley would do the same thing. That's hypocrisy. That's making no difference between the holy and the profane. All of a sudden, everybody's like, who's Pat Boone? I know who I'm talking to. Next, John chapter number 4. John 4, verse number 20. John 4, verse number 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus is taking those first half of those verses, verse 21 and 22, and he's deconstructing the worship that the people were participating in. He said, this worship that used to go on wasn't true worship. And the worship that's going on now isn't true worship. The worship that God seeks is, uh, is true worship. It's done in spirit and in truth. Let me tell you why. Here's the problem with formal worship. It's all done for show. Everything in a formal worship service is done for show. And even everything that's done in a, in a non-formal service, but's done in the name of worship, is done for show. Speaking in tongues is being done for show. All the hand waving and the eyes closing and, and all that, that's done for show. I read a book called Why I Left the Contemporary Christian Music Movement. It was written by a guy who used to be a, a praise and worship band leader. And he said, I had to get out of it because I saw the trouble with pride and sin in the whole movement. He said, people, people get up and, and we'd rehearse and everything, but then when, when the time for the service came, all of a sudden, I'd have a guitarist just step up to the front of the, the stage and go into a roaring solo, or I'd have a drummer do it, or the bassist to do it, or the soloist would take off. And then afterwards, I'd ask them, why did you do that? And you know what they said every time? The Spirit led me to. Really? The Spirit led you to step to the front of the stage with your electric guitar and wail for two or three minutes while the spotlight was on you? Usually the Spirit doesn't lead people to the spotlight. 
What Jesus is saying is, you know what? Everybody likes to show up at the temple in their fancy temple clothes with their big sacks of money, blasting trumpets before they put their money in the box. And they carry on and they, they point all attention to themselves. That's what the Sermon on the Mount was about. When ye pray, do not as the hypocrites do, for they pray to be seen of men. When ye give your alms, do not do as the hypocrites do, who blow a trumpet to be seen of men. When ye fast, do not as the hypocrites do, for they maketh themselves to look to fast as the hypocrites do to be seen of men. See, God frowns on us doing what we do for him so that other people can see us do it so that we get the glory for it. Now, let me say, there's nothing wrong with people seeing you do right if you're not seeking the glory for doing that right. That makes sense? But when you're doing what you're doing so that other people can see you, then you're doing it for the wrong reason, and it's not worship at all. Here, here's what we want to do. I want to go to the worship service, and I want to have the Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt, and, and I want to come down and I want to get the guitar solo during the morning worship set. And I want to make sure that everybody knows me there. And I'm going to check in and I'm going to post pictures and I'm going to get a selfie with the pastor. Everybody's going to know I was there. And what Jesus is teaching here is, you know what? God doesn't want any of that. What God wants you to do is he wants you to crawl out of bed at 1130 some night. And just go sit in your backyard and look at the stars and pray through the night. And you say, well, can I post about it? <laughs> no. Do you want to worship or do you want credit? Formal worship's all about the credit. We don't have time for that. I've got two minutes. Let's keep going here. We're almost there, aren't we? John chapter 12, verse number 20. John 12, 20. And there came, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip telleth Jesus and Jesus answered, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I'm trying to find uh, the verse that I'm trying to get to you here. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can't find it. I'm sorry. My point here was worship was done by bringing offerings, and I can't find it for you. I'm trying to rush. Acts chapter number 7. Acts 7, verses 42 and 43. Acts 7, 42 and 43. <clears throat> then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And this is Stephen's sermon to the Jews about the Old Testament history of the Jewish people. And when they worshipped the astrological signs and they made images and, and uh, the golden calf incident and so forth there. My point in all of those verses is simply to say you don't find corporate worship anywhere in there. Nowhere in the Bible do you find worship and a service combined. Now, let me run through this and wrap this up for you. Worship was and is always a private matter between a Christian and the Lord. Now, let me say, that doesn't mean that in a service you can't spend time worshiping God. When we're preparing the Lord's Supper elements and we're distributing them, I encourage you, bow your head and worship God during that time. 
When the invitation's given, come forward, get on your knees and worship God during that time. If your health is such that you can't kneel at the altar, many of our folks, you see them, they come and sit on the front pew and they'll bow their head and they'll worship God. You can worship God in a public service, but don't mistake the service for public worship. So we've covered point number one of our questions here tonight. Uh, the first one being uh, what the Bible says about worship. Now let's talk quickly about the purpose of the church. And you'll get this quick. We talk about this a lot. So what about the church? What about the church? Uh, if the church isn't the place to worship, what are we doing here then? Why do we meet three times a week? First off, the church of Jerusalem began to meet for various reasons. Number one, the strength of God's people. The strength of God's people. Christians who attend church faithfully are stronger than Christians that don't. Period. Number two, they... Uh, they attend for observing, I'm sorry, nourishment through preaching. Nourishment through preaching. The Bible says that we're fed by the milk of the word of God and by the meat of the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> we, we, they met for fellowship. Bible fellowship or no bible study sorry i'm way off uh bible study that's what we're doing now we're looking into the scriptures seeing what they say next observing the lord's what supper you have to do that corporately so we come together as a family of god and we observe the lord's supper next number five is fellowship you know we you you have to have friends and the bible says we're supposed to separate from the ungodly so if you're going to separate from something, you need to separate to something. And so we separate to the godly. If I worked for a company that had an office Christmas party, I wouldn't attend it. Because all they're going to do is smoke and drink and cuss and tell dirty jokes the whole time. You're going to see your boss drunk with a lampshade on his head. Lose all respect for him. So what do I do if I don't go to the office Christmas party? You come to ours. You come to the Christian party. Won't be any drinking at our party. Won't be any smoking. There won't be any cussing except for Rick probably. No, that won't happen either. Uh, you, you, you hang around clean, godly, living people. Next, encouragement. Encouragement. We've set up a whole program this November for that table to distribute notes of encouragement to each other. You come to God's house for encouragement. You come for edification. Edification is building you up. Motivation. We try to keep ourselves motivated. Next. When formal worship is substituted for the real purpose of the local church meeting, several things happen. People are not strengthened. People are not encouraged, and people are not motivated for the main task of preaching the gospel. People are not strengthened, people are not encouraged, people are not motivated for the main task of preaching the gospel. If you go through the book of Acts and you read the epistles written by Paul, you cannot come away with anything but the idea that the purpose behind the local church assembling on a regular basis, as we're commanded to do in Hebrews chapter 10, the purpose is for the continual propagation of the gospel. And in order to continue propagating the gospel, we must remain healthy spiritually. So it builds us up so that we can go out and help others get saved. Winston. Six, seven, eight, and ten. I don't even have a ten. Oh, Jesus rebuked the idea of of corporate or, or group worship. Where is that? I'm sorry. Oh, okay, Jesus, okay, I see these. Jesus rebukes the idea of group or corporate worship. 
Worship was done by bringing sacrifices, John 12, 20. Worship of golden calf. Does that help you? Shannon? Yeah, I skipped a bunch of the outline trying to get done for you. Let me... Yeah, I see it. Wor formal worship limits God's people to the what of man. Anybody got a guess? I don't think it would be pride probably. Let's see. Formal worship traditions of man. Formal worship limits God's people to the traditions of man. Anybody else miss one? And I skipped those all. You didn't miss them. I skipped them. All right. Very good. Very good. Let me, let me, I'm just going to say it one more time. If you ever wonder, why do we do this this way? There's a reason. Every time. We don't do anything by accident or just out of randomness. Everything we do, we do for a reason. Uh, so if you ever wonder, you're welcome to ask. I don't have any problem asking. Not now. We've got to get you out of here. But in general. Ushers, will you come forward? Let's receive our offering at this time. Please be faithful and generous in your giving. And let me just say, uh, Shannon, let me know the total of the deposit on Sunday. Thank you for being faithful to be grateful to God in your offerings. You have helped us come out of that hole that we found ourselves in in October. We met budget the previous week, and we certainly met budget this week, and then some. And so thank you so very much for your faithfulness to give. Brother Rick, would you please pray for this offering? Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing uh, so much for us. Help us to give back on the budget. All right, while they're taking the offering, I'll give you just a couple of announcements. Uh, Saturday morning, we still will have the soul winning visitation meeting. 10 o'clock, we'll meet right here in this section for those of you that can make it. And then Saturday night is our adult Christmas party. It'll be held downstairs. And let me just say, I understand some of you are out of town. Some of you are busy. When I say I'd come to the adult Christmas party instead of the office party, I'm using that as an illustration. I'm not trying to strong arm you into coming to the party. We want you to come if you're able to come. At the same time, if you already have plans or you're already, like I said, going out of town or whatever, or even just want to take the day and rest, I completely understand that. Uh, so don't think I'm, I'm trying to pressure you in that way. Uh, having said that, if you're coming, 6.30 here in the church downstairs, and uh, Shannon has called you or texted you about bringing something probably. If you haven't heard from her, see her tonight and let her know, and she can probably give you an idea idea of something to bring. The second thing about Saturday night is the food. Or no, that's not the second thing. That's the first thing that I just said. The second thing is I'm losing my mind. Uh, the third thing is bring a gift to exchange. If you'll bring a gift to exchange, you can leave with a gift. If you don't bring one, you won't be leaving with one. Uh, so <clears throat> bring one. $10 limit. You can go above that if you want. That's up to you, but we set it at 10 to make it affordable for everybody to participate. Wrap it up or bag it so that we can't see it. Don't put a name on it. Don't put a male or female on it. Just bring it, and we have lots of fun with that. So 6.30, we're usually done by 9.30. We all pitch in and clean up together, and we're good to go. 117 saved this year, 40 baptized so far. Uh, thank God every day is our prayer emphasis for the week, and I'm going to leave you alone with that. Thanks so much for being here. Hope you have a wonderful day tomorrow on Thanksgiving Day, and we'll see you hopefully sometime Saturday. God bless you. You're dismissed.